thank you for this kind invitation. And I think that we had uh, already several definitions of consciousness. And um, that ranges from uh, the self or consciousness being an illusion all the way up to cosmic consciousness that seems to be somehow everywhere. And this is kind of a problem for me as a simple medical doctor. And we heard Professor Hudetz already uh, as an anesthesiologist being faced to the challenge of um, giving drugs that make sure that the surgeon can do his, jo his job. And the same for uh, Professor Hamarov, who are every day making patients unconscious. So as a neurologist working in intensive care and rehab, how do we deal with it? We will need an operational definition. And so what I would propose is that we reduce this complexity of what we call consciousness into two very simple dimensions. So first of all, you need to be aroused. This already is quite a challenge for you right now because you had two and a half or one and a half hour of lecture. You just had a good Indian dinner. So your levels of arousal might be kind of suboptimal and it will be the challenge for me to keep them up. How, as a physician, can I quantify your level of consciousness or your arousal? Well, it's quite simple. I see a number of you eyes closed, so chances are you are less aware of what's being said um, on the stage. And so this is really how we do it with coma patients. When we quantify arousal, we look at eye opening and we will apply noxious stimulation to wake patients up. So I'll try to keep you up here during the next, how much time do we have, Mr. Chairman? 40 minutes, excellent. Because this is necessary, but as you will see, not sufficient to keep your awareness up there. Now, awareness, the next component of what we call here consciousness, is more tricky for us to quantify. So, um, if we take um, Professor Rafi Malak's wife, for example, and we ask the question, is she aware? Well, she's holding, you don't see it, a camera, and if she's using it properly, chances are that this non-reflex behavior for us from the outside is taken as proof that she is aware. Okay? So this is looking for non-reflex behavior. Clinically, we'll be using a mirror, we will move it from left to right, and we will check if the patients follow with their eyes or if they orient to noxious stimulation or push us away. The real awareness test at the bedside is to look for response to command. So let's take Mr. Chairman, and we ask the question, is he aware? We would ask him a question, for example, raise your left arm. No, they didn't see that. Raise your left arm. Okay, did you all see that? I'm not sure if there's philosophers in the room, but for us simple clinicians, this would be enough to be taken as proof that our chairman is conscious, aware of the environment. It's very important to stress that our clinical awareness test has a number of limitations. There might be different reasons why we could ask him the question to do something, and we don't see the answer. Maybe he's deaf, or his English is bad, and then we have a problem, right? Maybe um, he wants to move his arm, and the command leaves his motor cortex, but never arrives in the muscles because after a trauma, there's a lesion in the nerves or the spinal cord or the brainstem. And then really, we're in trouble because actually all we're doing with our quantification of awareness needs motor responsiveness. So, patients in coma, by definition, are unconscious because they cannot be awakened. They will never open the eyes and hands are considered to be unaware of their environment and their self. Coma will only last for a couple of days or weeks. Some will evolve to brain death, this very clear, uh, well-known criteria. If you have those, never ever a single patient has recovered consciousness. Others 
will quickly recover consciousness and communication. And then some patients will awaken, meaning they will open their eyes, they will even move, breathe spontaneously, but all those movements are considered pure reflexes, automatic. So this dissociation between consciousness, two components, recovery of arousal, while behavioral evidence of awareness is observed, was coined in the 70s, the vegetative state. I personally don't like that term um, with this vegetative, vegetable uh, connotation. So we now talk about unresponsive wakefulness. And this, unfortunately, unlike coma, can last for weeks, months, years, decades. And some of these patients, again, can evolve to what is uh, coined now as minimally conscious or maybe better, minimally responsive patients. Here, they again, after a coma, evolve to vegetative unresponsiveness, then at one point will show signs of non-reflex behavior. They would, for example, follow with their eyes when the mother goes from left to right in the, in the room. Or they would smile to their mother and only to seeing their mother. We can't say it's automatic, but it's very hard to make meaningful claims about the content of that awareness in the absence of any functional communication. By definition, with minimally conscious state pa patients, we cannot communicate, so we have no access. The uh, awareness cannot be shared. And as illustrated by this green graph, it also fluctuates in time. So it's, you would see the patient now, see some sign of non-reflex behavior, come back an hour later or the next day, and no sign whatsoever could be observed. So it's a very challenging po patient population. As soon as said as we have non-reflex behavior, we now call them minimally conscious minus, and then as soon as they pass the awareness test, remember, we ask raise your hand or squeeze my hand, then we call them minimally conscious plus. And then finally, there is a rare but not to miss entity called locked-in syndrome or pseudocoma, where patients awaken from their coma, fully conscious, yet unable to show it. They're paralyzed, they can't uh, produce any speech or control their um, facial mimicry. Their only way classically to communicate is through small blinks of the eye. This is classical locked-in syndrome. A good illustration of a dissociation there between motor function, which is nearly fully impaired, and residual cognition and conscious awareness. So basically what we've been doing is reducing the complexity to, of consciousness very pragmatically to two dimensions, arousal, the level clinically assessed by um, eye opening and awareness of the environment and of self. And we see that classically there is a positive correlation between these two. And this is what you experience every night when you go asleep. When you fall asleep, your level of arousal will go down to one point in um, sleep where you will lose awareness of what's happening around you. Also, there is a notorious exception. In REM sleep, where you have dreaming occurring, this is a good example where for us from the outside, it's very hard to make strong claims about subjective awareness, um, again, in the absence of communication. So when we reduce consciousness to two those those two dimensions, I would now propose to reduce awareness into its two main components, and that is awareness of the environment or external awareness, and that is everything you hear right now, you see, you feel, everything that goes through your senses, external awareness, and awareness of self, even if it's um, a bit of a dangerous uh, name to talk it, uh, like self, so I would prefer internal awareness, which basic, basically is all the rest, all those stimulus independent thoughts. This little voice talking to yourself, probably right now, um, saying you're hungry and you're hoping that it uh, will soon end and you can go and grab a coffee. So this internal um, dialogue you have with yourself, internal awareness. And these are negatively correlated. It seems to be the case that at any given time, you're more one or the other. And this is kind of the take-home message uh, where I think we now have increasing evidence that shows that when you change the function of the brain through anesthesia, uh, anesthetics, or in my case, brain damage, you change perception. You change external awareness, internal awareness, and we can now, using these functional imaging tools, 
Go and identify what we call the neural correlates of consciousness. It's not a small region in your brain. It's a network, and you can see it here. It's in the associative cortices, the gray matter. In red, you see the lateral frontoparietal network we consider is critical for external or sensory awareness. And in blue, this midline core, which um, increasing evidence is showing is important for the emergence of internal or self-awareness. And so what seems to be really important um, in this brain, these um, 80 billion neurons and these millions of billions of connections is indeed that, the communication, the connectivity within that frontoparietal awareness network and its deep centers um, in the thalamus, in the nonspecific um, thalamic nuclei. So this is uh, a summary slide where you see upper left the result of a statistical analysis where we compared patients who were awake yet unaware, so vegetative, unresponsive patients, with matched controls that were awake and aware by subtracting their positron emission tomography glucose scans, we can so identify the awareness network, this frontoparietal network that seems to be systematically impaired when you can be awake yet show no signs of awareness. And there's a number of other examples in neurology, you see them here, such as absence seizures, where patients show a little absence and now with fMRI, we can show that in blue, this frontoparietal network decreases its activity. And the same for complex partial seizures, where there is a loss of awareness. Now you see it in green data from Hal Blumenfeld. Um, only when you have loss of awareness, this frontoparietal network shows decreased activity, in this case measured with SPECT imaging. And then finally, sleepwalking, which is an interesting example of patients still showing automatic motor behavior, but failing the awareness test, no response to command. And this is a study done by Claudio Bassetti in Switzerland, where actually only one patient published in Lancet um, and still awaiting to be reproduced. It's very hard to do when patients in slow wave, sli uh, slow wave sleep start to walk. Um, he injected his tracer and then afterwards put the patient in the scanner and you see in yellow this frontoparietal network that decreases its activity. And then of course we know from patients who are comatose who cannot be awakened, uh, a condition that can be compared to sleep or um, pharmacological coma or general anesthesia. Again, in all three conditions where arousal went down and so did awareness, we see this frontoparietal network in black that decreases its activity. So we've reason to believe to think that consciousness is an emergent property of brain function and that within the brain it's not just diffusely um, the brain activity that um, is important for awareness, but this frontoparietal uh, global neuronal network. And that within this network, um, we think that there is a critical hub. You see here this red triangle, which is the precuneus and the adjacent posterior cingulate cortex, which in your brain right now is the area that is using the most energy, the most active. And it's exactly this um, posterior midline structure that is the most impaired in coma or vegetative uh, unresponsive wakefulness. It is, of course, preserved in pseudocoma, locked in patients, and it is minimally active in minimally conscious state uh, patients. So this seems to be a um, critical consciousness hub within the frontoparietal workspace. So our claim is that for you to be consciously aware, you don't need the primary cortices. We would consider as slave systems important to um, determine the content. Um, in this case, uh, for auditory perception, this is an older study where we presented auditory stimuli to coma patients in vegetative state, and you see that they still activate their auditory cortex in red, um, even if it is less um, intense and less widespread as conscious or minimally conscious pa patients. But most importantly to me, this activity was observed in coma patients or vegetative state patients as an island disconnected from, you see it in blue, this frontoparietal awareness network. We only saw this preserved connectivity when subjects were conscious or minimally conscious. So primary sensory cortices are, again, necessary, but not um, sufficient. And now we have...
very sophisticated tools, uh, mathematical tools in this case, dynamic causal modeling, collaborative study with Carl Friston in London, where we looked at high density EEG data in coma survivors, applying auditory stimuli, and we looked at uh, key centers. Number one is primary auditory cortices, number two, auditory uh, associative areas, and then three, this higher order frontal parietal activity. And it seems to be the case that for you to be consciously aware of these auditory stimuli, you need this top-down feedback connection, this red arrow we only observed in conscious or minimally conscious uh, subjects and never in patients who were unconscious. And of course, if this is true, um, this could be very helpful for us to make a better clinical diagnosis. And as we said, there's reason to believe that for you to be consciously aware, we need this frontal parietal network. And again, uh, a recent study um, by um, our group showed that in so-called resting state conditions where you put subjects in an fMRI, there's no specific task, no question. You just record their brain activity. And then the challenge for us is to decode this activity in terms of um, cognition, in our case, in terms of absence or presence of awareness. And so we tried with this study to um, have access to the uh, phenomenological content. So uh, healthy volunteers were in the fMRI, they heard a beep, and then we were asked to say, what were you thinking about just before the beep? Were you more externally oriented, um, the gray, uh, the red um, areas here, uh, seem to be more active, and when they scored more internally aware, you see this midline core that showed increased activity. And when we look at the temporal dynamics of these changes, you see here on the graph, in abscess you have time, and it turns out to be the case that at any given time it's more one or the other, and it seems to spontaneously fluctuate um, with a frequency of about 0.05 hertz. So every 20 seconds or so, you seem to be, um, by default, moving from external to internal awareness modes. And this is interesting because also the slow fluctuations we see in fMRI are of about the same frequency. And there's a number of studies where these hypotheses were tested. This is an older study done by Melanie Boli, who uh, here applied a laser stimulus in healthy volunteers. And again, if she compared those stimuli, and they were periluminal, um, half of the time subjects perceived them, the other half they said, I didn't feel anything. If we subtract both data sets, what do we see? Not primary somatosensory cortex, but this lateral frontal parietal uh, network you see there on the left. And more interestingly in this study, she showed that those spontaneous fluctuations in this external awareness network predicted her, um, permitted her to predict the subject's um, score, whether or not it was aware. When the network was more active, more uh, higher in the bolt activity, the chances were higher that uh, subsequently the laser stimulus would be coded as perceived by the subject. It is much more difficult for us to study internal awareness. This is a study we did with the Chinese, where we use the own name, a very attention-grabbing autoreferential stimulus. If you hear uh, your own name at a conference, um, if I would say stewards, it would grab uh, stewards' attention. This is the cocktail party effect, and it would activate his anterior cingulate cortex. And again, the graph shows that there's more activity if our coma uh, consciousness scales are showing higher values. And again, this is, um, if true, of clinical value for us. And then one last example uh, on hypnosis, I think, a physiological reality close to um, meditation. You have much more experience with um, in this audience. And again, I think that we now have the tools to go and try identify the neural correlates of such um, very difficult to describe subjective states. This is the case for um, hypnosis also where you see um, in healthy volunteers that in the condition they are more absorbed, they are uh, reporting a dissociated state with less external thoughts and as predicted by our hypothesis, this lateral frontal parietal network you see here in blue is still present in the control distraction task but um, this shows 
this connection disappears in hypnosis. So um, in Deeds confirming that the lateral frontal parietal network is important for external awareness and that this goes down in hypnosis. So, now turning from the neural uh, correlate of consciousness and scientific interest to the clinical interest into making this a better diagnostic tool. So, as said, when coma patients open the eyes but only show reflex movements, they're called vegetative, unresponsive. Next, when we see non-reflex behavior, such as appropriate smiling or localization to pain or visual pursuit, they're called minimally conscious state minus. And then the next boundary is the recovery of response to command minimally conscious plus. And again, using PET imaging, we could show that MCS minus and plus show substantial differences in brain function. You can see here that MCS minus has more left lateralized brain damage. And this is the dominant hemisphere encompassing the language network. So this makes sense because um, these patients, minimally conscious state minus, um, could be aware but don't understand language. And this is a big problem for us um, than to say meaningful things in the absence of the awareness test being passed. And as said, this awareness test requires you to understand the command and to show a motor response. And this can be a problem, and it's one of the reasons we developed, um, together with the Cambridge team, this non-motor uh, dependent task where we put subjects in an fMRI machine and we ask them again to do something, imagine to move. We don't look at the movement anymore, but we look at the activity in the motor cortex. And so this is what was done here um, in a multicentric study where we had about 50 patients with um, disorders of consciousness, clinically no way to communicate with them, but when we put them in the scanner and ask them, in this case, imagine playing tennis, so imagine to do sport, you see that these very severely uh, damaged brains activate supplementary motor cortex um, in these four um, examples. And then you see the other task, which was imagine to um, find your way in your house, activating the parahypocampal areas. Again, you see in blue these patients um, showing that they understood the command and repeatedly um, did the task. And this was then um, a possibility for us to go a step further. And this was the first case where we could um, communicate with patients clinically diagnosed vegetative, so it was a patient sent to Belgium with diagnosis vegetative state, actually it turned out in reality it was minimally conscious, but we couldn't communicate and then in the fMRI we saw that there was this activation and we asked six questions, you can see it here. Um, first question, when you see more red means more activation of motor areas, so he was answering yes because the um, trick here is that we said imagine playing tennis to answer yes, imagine doing the spatial navigation to answer no, very complicated um, um, instructions, and yet we could see from his brain activity he was answering yes, answering no, more blue, no, yes, no, and then the sixth question, probably he was exhausted, no answer whatsoever. And I think this is a proof of concept that yes indeed there are a minority of patients were from the outside, we fail to establish communication and through these uh, new technologies we can try and establish a motor independent pathway, which of course is not very practical because as soon as the patient comes out of the fMRI you lose that channel and then you need to find alternatives. This is what we did here using EEG based brain computer interfaces. It's the same principle, you put on EEG detectors and you ask a question, in this case move your foot or move your hand. You don't look at the hand or foot movement, but you look at the activation in the motor cortex, the area for foot uh, more midline and for hand more laterally. And then you can read the answer in the brain activity. Again, this is very difficult to do because we also uh, don't have the gold standard. What is the absolute truth? Um, should we trust the machine? Um, how do we deal with possible false positives, false negatives? It's terribly challenging, but I think that um, 
many teams are now working on this subject and progress is being made continuously. However, we still are faced with a problem because when we ask patients to imagine something, they still need to understand language. And we just said that that, for many of them, can be a problem. So we need language-independent tests. And this is these uh, resting state fMRI where we used um, the bold fluctuations as a possible index of higher order cognition. So you again see how it looks like. This midline core and the graph shows time and you show these, you see these fluctuations, one area correlating with another we call functionally um, connected and we think that this correlates with self-awareness. We tested the hypothesis first in brain death and then you see no ball signal whatsoever um, was uh, to be observed. Next, we went to pseudocoma, and you there see on the right-hand side a patient with locked-in syndrome, where from the outside it's very hard to uh, get a proof of um, residual awareness. And when you look at the resting state of fMRI, you see those yellow blobs reflecting functional connectivity in the self-awareness network. So very clearly, this patient was not comatose. And you also see the brainstem lesion that classically is observed in this kind of classical locked-in syndrome. But as said, we should be very careful. And when we have new tests, we not only should validate the test or the machine, um, next we should also um, validate the answers coming from the subject. So this, I think, is uh, a big challenge we'll be facing in years to come. And thanks to the validation in, for example, pharmacological coma. This is a study by uh, Pierre Beauvroux of our team using propofol anesthesia, showing the breakdown of connectivity in the awareness network, not as you can see in the slave systems. You see sensory uh, visual areas and auditory uh, areas still being functionally connected even in the absence of awareness. So um, confirming with what we just said uh, regarding the frontoparietal awareness hypothesis. And of course, if this is true, we can clinically apply it, and this is done here in this paper, where you see a breakdown, a nonlinear breakdown of functional con connectivity in the default mode network in healthy controls and locked in syndrome over minimally conscious to vegetative and comatose patients. And the difference between minimally responsive and unresponsive, again, was in this triangle, the precuneus and posterior cingulate cortex. One can also look at resting state EEG data and quantify entropy changes. This is work done by Olivia Gossery, now in uh, medicine. And she shows us here in this graph that patients who are unconscious show lower levels of entropy. But again, on the right, you see how tricky it can be, a patient showing fluctuating uh, higher levels of entropy. This was a case of a false positive, because when she, give, uh, she gave neuromuscular blocking agents, you see the muscle activity goes away and the entropy is then very low. So the machine, the algorithm considered signal coming from the muscles as coming from the brain gave us a false positive. And then very briefly, one last technique I think is very interesting for us, and we'll see more of that in the future, is transcranial magnetic stimulation coupled to simultaneous EEG recording. So here um, you can excite any part of the cortex and simultaneously measure the changes in functional connectivity with your EEG. It's very hard to do, but it works very nicely when we look at coma patients that we can follow over time when they're here unresponsive. You see the cross. This is where we stimulate. Um, and when they're comatose or vegetative, there is very little activity. It's stereotyped and it stays under the coil. As soon as they're minimally conscious, it spreads to the other hemispheres, to the front. It's getting more complex. Um, and this, again, is currently being tested as a prognostic indicator because we believe that conscious awareness um, is an emergent property of the functional connectivity within this frontoparietal network. And of course, if this is true, this can be uh, useful for us to quantify and then to predict the chances of recovery after coma. Another way to predict outcome is using functional MRI, the brain's response to external stimuli. In this case, again, an attention-grabbing autoreferential stimulus, the own name, and you see those rare patients that show these atypical high-level activations 
were the ones that subsequently recovered. And again, we tried to develop cheaper and more portable um, devices using EEG that do the same thing with event-related potentials. And then lastly, there's two papers that came out, um, diffusion tensor imaging. So you see here this nicely colored, colored uh, slice where you see those millions of billions of connections in the brain, so the white matters integrity measured by diffusion tensor imaging. In blue, the pyramidal tracts going to the muscles. In red, transcolosal interhemispheric correction. And then in green, the front to back connections. If we quantify the damage, which was done in these two papers, both for traumatic and non-traumatic um, patients in a multicentric um, study led by Paris, where we were able to separate good from bad outcome patients on a single patient uh, level. Moving from the challenge of diagnosis, prognosis, to the challenge of treating these patients. And one of the first questions, I think, is, well, should we treat for pain? And this is a very difficult question. Actually, it's so difficult, we asked uh, more than 1,600 European doctors. And you can see on the graph, I'm not sure if you can read it, to the question, do you think that patients in a vegetative state can feel pain? The answer couldn't be more um, ambiguous. About 56% said yes, even more if we asked the nurses. And it was interesting that their religious beliefs correlated mostly with their answers. Um, now, of course, this is having very practical consequences because if you consider the patient feels pain, you should treat for it. And not only these patients cannot tell you I feel pain, also if you start with painkillers, they are unable to say you um, I don't feel pain anymore. So how do we deal with it? Well, first I think we need to speak the same language. We need a scale that standardizes the application and the scoring of um, the response to the noxious stimulation. This is what Caroline Schnackers um, did here, calling it the nociception coma scale, uh, published in Pain in 2010, and there's a revised version last year. It's very simple, a score from zero to nine. If it's more than three, um, you should give painkillers and get the number below three. Again, it's out for further clinical validation, um, but it's terribly simple uh, looking at motor, verbal, um, and visual responses in a standardized way. Of course, we would like to go further, and we can. With functional imaging, we can now measure what's happening in the brain when you perceive pain. Again, pain is multidimensional. You can't reduce it um, to one region. Here on these glass brains, you see the network, the pain matrix that activates when you perceive pain. When we did the same thing in brain death, there was no neuronal activity whatsoever. To our surprise, and to the surprise of the medical community, when we looked at vegetative state patients, they not only activated the brain stem, the thalamus, but also the red circle, primary sensory cortex. Now, this activation, just for the auditory stimulation, remember, seems to exist like an island disconnected from this frontoparietal awareness network considered to be critical for the conscious perception of the stimulus. Now, this uh, result stood in sharp contrast to what we saw in patients who were minimally conscious. So, remember, these patients sometimes only track with the eyes, nothing more. When we apply noxious stimulation, no, of course, expression of any uh, experience, but you see that their brain scans tell us the whole pain matrix now activates, including anterior singlet cortex, we think is important for the effective emotional component of pain. So, in our opinion, these patients uh, who cannot tell us they feel any pain, their brain scans do, and we should systematically um, treat with uh, analgesics. One last word on treatment, and of course, better understanding is possibly better treating. This is an old study where we showed that these patients suffer from a thalamocortical disconnection. With, uh, we could identify the intralaminar nuclei and that they were reconnected when patients recovered from the condition, from the vegetative state. And this work, uh, together with animal work, led Nico Schiff in New York to implant electrodes in exactly those same intralaminar nuclei and stimulate, um, excite these areas, and as he showed a couple of years ago, later improved awareness in post-traumatic minimally conscious state patients. But this is still research. There's still many more um, 
parameters that we need to understand before this will become um, maybe, maybe not a routine procedure. And of course, we need to be very careful, but uh, because these patients cannot give their consent, and yet I think we cannot keep these new developments um, and their potential benefits from this vulnerable patient group. So we decided to describe the framework uh, together with um, legal scholars from Stanford um, and uh, again Cornell University how to deal with this research in this very challenging patient population. Where in the end we're from the intensive care all the way over rehab fighting for a better quality of life to these patients. And this again is a very difficult question. How can you reduce the complexity of quality of life to one number? We can do it briefly together. Mr. Chairman, I will um, invite you to imagine the worst period in your life. Can you do that? Worst? The worst period in your life. Imagine that. That is minus five. And now the best period in your life. You're all invited to do that, except for this meeting, of course. That is plus five. And now you can answer my question. The past two weeks, on this scale that you calibrated from minus five to plus five, you were, you don't have to say me, but this is what we observed in patients who were locked in. So remember, you cannot be more motor handicapped than this, and we see plus three, plus five. Many of these, actually the majority of these patients, um, telling us they have a meaningful life. We should be very careful not to judge a book on its cover. Quality of life and motor impairments are very different. Um, and I think this is a nice way to end this talk where we now have all these new technologies to try and better understand this very difficult concept we call human consciousness, as you've heard so many times at this meeting. And I think it's really about putting all these possible machines and measurements together and integrate that into a meaningful theory that we can again test and try to prove wrong, because that's what it's all about in science. And in conclusion, I hope to show you, to show you some evidence that uh, we consider conscious awareness as an emergent property of this collective critical uh, neural network dynamics involving this frontoparietal global workspace with lateral frontoparietal areas for external awareness and midline in blue for internal awareness. And if it is true, it's important because we'll make a better diagnosis, we'll be able to predict the outcome. And regarding treatment, we've briefly mentioned pain and deep brain simulation. So clearly it's very fascinating to see how these emerging technologies um, fMRI already revealed subclinical command following, so challenging our clinical boundary of awareness. And we tend to see it as a black or white line. We put things in boxes. In reality, as we've seen from the start, it's more a graded continuum. And then the next challenge is to establish functional communication. And these are all the um, fellows who did the job. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stephen. It's always a great talk. Uh, I'm curious what your, uh, how you define brain death. Do you, uh, you're probably asked to declare people brain dead. Let's say they want to take them for organ procurement. Uh, is it a clinical study, the breathing test, apnea test, or do you do imaging? No, so um, I think it's very important to be clear about the um, operational criteria of brain death defined as coma with non-cause where we exclude a number of factors such as hypothermia, uh, intoxication, and show that there is no brainstem reflex including the apnea test. And with those clinical criteria properly applied in the medical literature, there isn't a single case that recovered consciousness. And then I think the best uh, objective test to confirm it is not so much the EEG because we have a sensitivity specificity of about 95% only there, but um, measures that quantify blood flow, um, like uh, arteriography or, more easy to obtain, echo Doppler, um, help us to confirm that there's no blood flow to this brain that needs such high amounts of energy and that uh, the situation is irreversible. So it's, of course, important, and it is not to be confounded with clinical death, which is, um, I think, to be avoided. It just means that the heart stopped beating and we've very good uh, for some of these to resuscitate, but it has no neurological criteria. And I think um, it's important to disentangle clinical death, to be avoided from brain death, and uh, that indeed this is linked to organ donation, and we need to be very, very clear, because um, we have every year patients dying on waiting lists, uh, waiting for their transplants. Yeah.